of the time. I, I just, I live for the solitude and the quiet of it. I, I, because on the trail, if you're just hiking, you can just, I can just let my feet carry me on from one wonder to another, and it is glorious. If Pastor Trevor ever disappears for like a week, it's usually because if he isn't with a family vacation, I've managed to coerce him every like three years to go hiking with me. That's about as much time as our friendship allows me to steal him away. But I would be out there almost every single week. It is my favorite time, in theory. But a strange thing happens when I'm hiking, because even though I'm there for the journey, I find that the longer I hike, the more I start looking down. It's like the weight of my pack is just forcing my gaze from wonder and onto my feet. And I rarely even notice that it's happening until sometimes miles and miles have passed and I suddenly have no idea what I missed seeing. I just get lost in my own thoughts and in the next step. And let me tell you, there is nothing that is quite as disconcerting as coming upon an intersection in the middle of the forest and not having a clue where you are or which way you're supposed to go. You're just walking, trail, tra multiple trails. This could be a problem. It is one of the most disconcerting feelings I have ever had in my life. And it's times like that that you really want a trail marker to make sure that you're on course. Now, for those of you who don't know, or don't know the outdoors, and I will attempt to love you anyway, most long trails have special, and don't worry, my wife doesn't appreciate the outdoors either, and I try and love her too, so you're in good company. But most long, though, to be fair, she tries to love me more, but anyway. Most long trails have special symbols, right? that mark the intersections and that periodically show up while you're on trail to let you know that you're still on the right path. This is my favorite marker, right? It's for the PCT, or if you don't know, it's got the Pacific Crest Trail, which runs from Mexico all the way to Canada up the spine of the Cascades and the Sierras, over 2,500 miles. First time I set foot, on the PCT, and I saw one of those markers, it was electric. Because I knew I was on a path that would take me past glaciers and mountains, take me past redwoods and deserts, take me through remote wilderness and over mossy streams if I just kept following it. And that was exciting for me. I know, I get excited about all but the PCT runs through some of the most amazing scenery in the entire world. And yet every single day when I'm on it, I still catch myself just staring at the dirt in front of my feet. I think the church is there a good portion of the time. Right? I, we're supposed to be on this amazing journey of faith. But so often we just get lost in the mundane. Because life is hard. We can get worn down by its burdens. We can get worn down even by the good that just becomes routine. And instead of looking up at what God has been doing in this world throughout history, instead of looking up at what God has been doing in our lives, we can only see what's at our feet. We end up staring at what we have to deal with right now. And it wears us down. It beats us down. Because we were promised grand views on this journey with God. So why do we only see dirt and rocks and dust? Trapped in our moment with flawed people and flawed churches. And usually the church's teachings, we center around our feet, too. 
We focus on the next steps in our lives. We focus on the rocks right in front of us, and we mine the Bible for ideas and solutions to this next step. And it's good to stop and examine things closely. It's good to see what is around us with a clearer light. But sometimes we need to lift up our heads and take a look at the bigger picture. Because I truly believe that the big picture is amazing. I mean, the journey of God and God's people is astoundingly beautiful. And that's the story that the Bible tells. As for centuries, people searched for God. And when they found the divine at work in their lives, they cried out, look, look, that's God. Like right, right over there. Like, come on, check God, everybody. And that's what they wrote down. That's what we have. And we're part of that same journey. Though it doesn't often feel like it, because so often we just, are staring at our feet. But we're still looking for God-filled moments to get excited about, aren't we? I mean, that's still part of, part of what we're hoping to find when we show up to churches like this. Well, today I'm going to try to tell the story of the journey to find God at work. But to really appreciate where we are on a path, we need to be able to recognize some of the trail markers along the way. So before we begin, yes, this is still the introduction, I want to take a look at a few key ideas in the Bible, a couple of, of trail markers that you have probably read and seen a hundred times before, but maybe you just didn't recognize their importance and passed them by. Barely a glance. So every word in every language has a concept that it represents. So some words convey massive ideas, while other words represent very narrow, very specific concepts. English language today likes long, but highly specific words, right? My cousin, for example, is a pediatric hematological oncologist. Sure, which basically means she deals with babies who have blood cancer conveys a much narrower idea than just doctor or healer, right? We like specifics in English. We don't just have a word for sky. Oh, no, that's way too vague. We say atmosphere, and then we break up atmosphere into troposphere and stratosphere and exosphere and who knows how many other spheres. Some of you do, and some of you are Googling it. Stop. Clouds are part of that sky. Right? But it isn't just a cloud. Of course it's not just a cloud in English. It's a cumulus cloud. It's a cirrus cloud. It's a stratus cloud. We have divided up the universe into hundreds of thousands of words with very small, very narrow meanings. But Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, isn't like that at all. Every single main word in Hebrew is built of only three letters. So they liked very short words with huge context. Enormous range of meaning. Their world was still divided, but it was divided not into a whole bunch of little pieces. It was divided into big pieces. It was divided into big concepts. No pediatric hematological oncologist for them. No, 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 no. Healer would have been just fine. So two words in particular, two Hebrew words, I want to point out as trail markers throughout Scripture as we look at it today. And they are Ruach and Shemayim. Now, to ancient Israelites, as to us, God was invisible. So naturally to them, all of the invisible stuff, everything that's invisible, is where God lives. That seems pretty simple. And that invisible stuff has a name. Shemayim. It is a huge word that gets translated as heaven, sky, space, atmosphere. Little words, little words that we use to fill a big idea. But the invisible stuff, all of the invisible stuff to the Hebrews was Shemayim. The home of the invisible, creative, 
all-powerful God. And when we can feel that invisible, when God is moving, when life is pumping, when something is happening, that's ruach. Wind, spirit, breath, all one word, all one concept to them. Ancient Israelites considered the breath, the ruach, the source of our life. It is our spirit. And so it is, is also how we feel the invisible at work because the wind blowing to the ancient Israelites was the literal breath of God speaking change into the world, continuing to shape it, to make it, to form. Now our story begins, literally, with the world in chaos and nothingness. Symboled as usual in, symbolized as usual in the Bible, by water, until God spoke. And the power of his ruach, the power of his wind, his spirit, his voice, pushed back the chaos and formed something brand new. Not just a globe, but dirt, earth, land. The chaotic waters held back by the presence and breath of God, making a home for both God and for the first time for creatures. And God continued to speak from the invisible realm, God's wind carrying out God's will, carving out canyons, forming trees, shaping, making, encompassing the entire world. And God breathed some of his ruach, and it became the breath of life, a piece of the creator inside each living being. And everywhere there was earth, Air was there too. Shemayim filling in every gap, intersecting every place. The perfect fit. The invisible home of God caressing the visible home of creation. And this intimacy wasn't just an image either. God's presence was right there. The first creation walked with God, heard God, saw God, spoke with God. God was right with them. Shemayim, heaven, was right there, and they knew the sound of God's voice. But then came the fall. The first split between God's realm and the human realm. When people decided that they wanted to walk their own path. They wanted their own heir, and as a result, they were cast out of Eden. Cast out of the earth, the dirt, the land that God had provided. And they fell. And with that fell, heaven just seemed a little bit more out of reach. It felt a little bit less like the air that they felt around them and a little more up there. There was a break in the relationship. But they were still close. God still spoke and the people still knew God's voice. Even Cain, the first murderer, heard God vo God's voice speak recognized it, and knew God's will. How many of you have ever wanted to feel, guilt, feel jealous of the first murderer before? But I would love to be able to hear God's voice that well as he did. But the trick is that he decided to ignore God's ruach and walk away. And while some people did listen to God, Enoch even walked with God again. Most people kept walking away. The divide kept growing until no one was listening to the message that God's rule was carrying. Instead, every breath that they breathed was evil. The ruach that God gave perverted. How could Shemayim, how could God's home caress such evil? Could it? God, Shemayim, parted. And the waters of chaos that had been holding back rushed in, covering the earth. Creation undone. The breath of life snuffed. The home of humanity was gone, and once again, only heaven and chaos remained. Except for one boat. One person had felt God's ruach, had heard God's voice in it, and had listened. 
Noah and his family survived. And when everything else was gone, God's ruah blew again over the world as it had in the beginning. And it drove the waters back, creating a new earth. And while the presence of God was once again holding back chaos and nothingness, while Noah is even said to walk with God in the Shemayim where God lives, the crack in the relationship persisted. The Shemayim, for most people, had begun to seem farther, farther away. More in the clouds, less in the air they breathe. And this distance between God and humanity only continued to grow and become more obvious to every single person who chose to stop for just a moment and feel that something was missing. It was obvious to every people who heard the wind blow and knew it was meaningless. Centuries later, in the land of Ur, they felt the separation from God. They knew they couldn't hear God's Spirit anymore, and they wanted it back. But instead of listening, instead of repenting, they built a tower into Shemayim that was seemingly just out of jump reach. In an attempt to reunite the home of humanity with the home of God. To drive the visible into the invisible and rejoin them by force. And God saw that the spirit breathed into these humans was united, but against the Lord. So God split the people's breath. He split up their ruach, their languages, so they could not be united against the Lord anymore. Humanity spread across the earth, time passed, and in the land of Ur, known as the land of sky and wind, that's all they were. Until a man named Abram heard God's whisper in his ear. He heard the Ruach. He felt the Shemaim, and he followed. He followed God for a thousand miles, and God gave Abram a new name, new ground to claim, a new earth to live on, and a promise that if Abraham's descendants would just, would just listen for God's ruah and walk in God's presence, then God would bless his descendants as they lived in this new earth. For a while it worked. Abraham's son, Heard God's voice, saw God work, but didn't walk with the Lord. Abraham's grandson, Jacob, saw angels walking back and forth from heaven to earth, from Shemayim to Eretz, but they traveled by ladder, and he saw them only in a dream. Heaven was slipping away, and with it, God's voice. Jacob fell away from God, and his children went so far as to use their faith as a cover to murder an entire town. Even the closest son to God, Joseph, didn't hear God except through abstract dreams. God had become hazy. God's voice had become indistinct and far away. Focused on the mundane, the people wandered, lost on their own paths, and soon God's people disappeared. Sunk into a culture that made them literal slaves in Egypt. Trapped by the world's brokenness that God had raised them up to overcome. Far, far from the earth that they had been promised. And then silence. For four Hundred years. No one breathes in the wind or feels the air on their face and thinks of God. The people just drift away. Their heads down, focused on the path right in front of them. They get frustrated. They lose hope. Heaven is far away. God's voice is forgotten. But while humanity sunk into sin, pushing heaven further and further away, God did not leave. And a major theme of the Bible is saying, is God saying, let's redeem that. 
by whatever is necessary, by however extraordinary the methods necessary, let's redeem that. And the extraordinary is exactly what it took. A bush on fire in the middle of a desert is finally what caught the eye of a fugitive murderer named Moses. Not my first pick. God's voice called to Moses on the divine ruach, and Moses didn't recognize it. Moses needed to be reminded to take his shoes off, that the earth he was on was holy, because the people had forgotten that God could come to earth. The people had forgotten that something here could be made holy like that. And even when God spoke, Moses didn't recognize his voice. I am the God of your ancestors, the Lord says. And Moses goes, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Still nothing. Finally, Moses asks for a name. Like, could uh, Steve, you say? Like, he needed to differentiate this God from all of the other gods that he knew. Because the people wouldn't know which God was speaking otherwise. Imagine how that must have broken God's heart to go from walking and talking with people, them knowing God was present in the very air they breathe, listening for God's voice in the breeze that caresses your face, to your people not even recognizing which God is speaking, or sensing the Lord's presence when it's right in front of them. It is wonderful that God did not abandon the people and that, call, and that he called Moses to lead them, but it is also heartbreaking because never before in the story has God needed a spokesperson. The people are just not listening. They do not recognize God's voice among all the voices calling to them in the world. For the first time, they needed a hearing aid. They needed a prophet to speak God's words for them. From now on, God's ruah would carry a message, not to the people, but to a chosen prophet, who would then carry the message, carry that ruah, carry those words to share with the people who otherwise wouldn't hear or know God. It wasn't that God wasn't there anymore. The people simply didn't know where to look. They didn't know how to listen. They were hurting and they were tired, so they looked at their feet. They dealt with surviving that day, and they assumed that God must be somewhere far away and uninterested in them. So when Moses came with a message from the God they had never heard of, let alone heard from, it shocked them, but it also reinvigorated them because this meant there was a God that was interested in them. They were not just slaves. They were God's chosen. A God was calling them. In time, Moses convinced the people that God in the Shemayim was indeed calling them. And they escaped Egypt in a great exodus, which climaxed when once again the Ruach of God blew across the waters, creating land for the people to walk across so they could be with God in their new earth. It was when God's presence was known in a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. Not seen, but known to be right there. Shemayim drawing near. After leading the people out of Egypt, Moses went up on a mountain where God spoke. Moses listened, passing on to the people what would become the law. This law was meant to teach people God's will, God's ways, when they couldn't recognize God's voice any other way. Words from God, the breath of God mixed with Moses' own breath and spoken out to the people in ways that they could hear and hopefully understand. It was meant to point people in the right direction so they could walk toward God's will. They could learn again to see and hear their Lord. 
And God promised that if the people would just follow, then I will put my dwelling place among you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. God would live with them. Shemayim, heaven come down. It would be like Eden, it, like it was meant to be. But it only slightly worked. Time passed. More prophets came and went. The people led by a series of judges fell away from God and returned and fell away and returned time and time again. Until finally the people began to cry out that we don't, we don't want this anymore. We don't want to try and listen to you. We're tired of trying to listen to God. Give us the king. God's voice wasn't enough for them. They wanted to follow somebody that they could see. Somebody that they could hear. Someone's voice that they could follow into battle. After all, wasn't heaven so very far away? Wasn't God so high above them? The main voice that the people listened to now wouldn't be God's, it would be the king's. And God knew it was a bad idea. But he allowed it. And there were good times with kings who knew that they needed God's presence. They needed God's ruach. Like when King David said, do not cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit, your ruach, away from me. But even the best of their kings led the people astray. Soon the people were worshiping other gods and neglecting their own. The kings misled them, nations surrounded them, enemies arose, and it seemed that God had abandoned them the same way they had abandoned God. Shemaiah must be far away. Ruah was just the wind. But God was still there. If only the people looked. When the prophet Elisha's town was surrounded by enemies, his servant was terrified, absolutely terrified. And the prophet prayed, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And the man looked up and saw. He saw chariots of fire roaming the hills. He saw the armies of God, the presence of God's power, signs of God at work. Not up somewhere else, but everywhere he looked, all around him. Shemayim was close, but his eyes would not see it. No one was looking. No one at all. The people kept falling. The nation of Israel split, in, split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom of Israel fell so far that they permanently broke their relationship with God. And so God, using the armies of Assyria, removed them from their land, put them back where he had found them, in the land of Ur. And they vanished forever, lost and ignorant of the God right there. Judah held out for a little while longer, but they too ignored heaven, so they lost their earth. They were put back where God found them, like a divine reset button. And all this while, even in the midst of these violent deportations, God's prophets were there, shouting God's words, yelling at the people, stop ignoring the Lord, stop treating the poor like dirt, stop relying on yourselves, and trust in the God who gave you this new land. But the prophets were ignored, mocked, abused, thrown down a couple of wells, kidnapped a couple of times, and killed. The last stuttering words of the prophets, like dying echoes of a voice that you should recognize, brought the people of Judah back to God just enough that God returned them to their earth. And then, again, nothing. Only the law remained as evidence of God's will and God's voice. For 400 years, there was silence. And as people, God's people read and reread the law, they became more 
and more convinced that they had fallen beyond the reach of even God's voice. That God's realm and ours cannot possibly meet. Heaven and earth, Shemayim and Eretz, they must be infinitely apart. Surely God is too holy to speak in a human voice or to us fallen humans. Right? We are too fallen to hear. We are too fallen to have God's presence with us. Maybe our prayers can't even reach God. Until God came to earth. John says that the word which spoke creation, the word that shaped the stars, the word which is God became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. When heaven seemed so out of reach, when no one could hear God, when no one could see God, when no one could walk with God anymore, God came here. If heaven is where God dwells, then heaven came down, the Shemayim came, the sky fell. And we could walk with God, touch God, speak with God. Hear God. Learn what God wants. People heard clearly what had gotten distorted over the years. They could relearn where our focus really should be. When God could not tilt our heads up, God came down. And we saw the image of the invisible God. And this God-man, Jesus, promised restoration, forgiveness, a new Adam and a new line of humanity. It's God reaching out, a divine shout of, you are not too far gone. You are not lost. You are not out of my sight or away from my heart. You don't have to climb up to me because I'm coming to you. And Jesus came proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven is near. It's not up there not out there. It's as close as the air caressing your face. The world isn't broken and being restored. It's being redeemed. Join. God's kingdom, God's realm where God lives and walks and talks and it heard is right here. It always has been. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only. What does God look like? Jesus. What does God sound like? Jesus. What does God want? What Jesus wants. Do, do you see why this was so earth-shatteringly amazing to the people who first heard it? Through his death, the gap between us and God is forgiven. The crack in creation is healed a new line of humanity, a new Adam to emulate. And even when Jesus returned to the Shemayim, we were not left empty. Jesus promised that God's spirit, his breath, power, life, ruach, would breathe down, not like it used to, in one person at a time, but to all who believed. And it did. The holy breath of God blew through the upper room on Pentecost with the same power that shaped the mountains and carved out the valleys. And no longer do people sit in silence. We can hear. You, me. We can have that Holy Spirit. We can be filled, inspired, guided, led, spoken to. God wants to speak to us, with us, through us, not just the pastor, not just the preacher, or a prophet, or a king, but each and every one of us. He doesn't want to have to use a messenger. He wants you to hear. Because Jesus came down to draw us back up. Back into a walk with God until creation is restored. And it's not finished yet. But it's getting there. 
God spoke to someone caring for the wounded, and they listened to the holy ruach, and the first hospital was born. A man watching children die on the street felt God's spirit move in him, and he made the first orphanage. The first people screaming against slavery. A scientist studying disease was inspired to create the smallpox vaccine. A woman watching drunk men leaving their families to starve to death was inspired to start the temperance movement, which became the woman's suffrage movement. They knew God's breath. Martin Luther King felt God's breath as he dreamed of a new world restored. God is here, still working, still redeeming, still breathing and speaking and inspiring. Look up! See the trail marker. And this is not the end. There is still more to come. With sights untold to see. It is promised that chaos will be finished. And there will once again be a new home for humanity and for God dwelling fully together. Creation restored, remade. John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Intimacy realized. Union restored. But until then, God will not leave. God's Spirit will not stop speaking. In all of history, the Ruach of God has never stopped blowing. God is here. That's the point of the Bible. God is here. The Spirit is here. In this walk of life, do not get so weary that your eyes are only focused on the dirt in front of you. Lift up your head sometimes. Look around and see what God has done in this world. Watch for the trail markers pointing out the way to our Lord. Slow down to listen to the holy voice that calls us all. And let the Spirit of God blow back the chaos that has trapped you for so long. Pastor Trevor?